going on, everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know who it is. This is Kevin from the Code Progression Podcast, where we are interviewing all the bands emerging in the rock and metal scene today that are going to be the biggest bands come the end of the decade. And today, guys, <laughs> I've got a great one for you. Thank you to the Sirius XM Octane fans for and my buddy Chris for telling me how great this band was. And yeah, we got them. So please welcome from the band blacktop mojo the front man matt as we dive deep into the under the sun album and just have a blast talking about some fun things as well can't wait to have a beer with these guys are you ready let's go yeah well 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 ladies and gentlemen boys and girls listeners to the court progression podcast a couple weeks ago i posted on a serious xm octane fan page about okay what emerging bands in the scene right now are you guys really into and the first and most consistent response was band blacktop mojo one of my friends kept saying you gotta check them out you gotta check them out and this was the final push i'm like okay i've heard some of their stuff let's go deep dive into it and i really liked it so i'm like okay let's give it a shot let's see if we can get some of these guys in the podcast and i'm so thankful because here today with me is the front man the lead singer for the band Black Top Mojo, please welcome Matt. So, Matt, welcome to the Core Progression Podcast. Thanks for having me on, bud. Thanks for being on. This is like, this is, I've been since the, yesterday when you guys are like, yeah, let's do this. I mean, my heart's been kind of beaten. I've been focusing on the music. I probably listened to your album like Under the Sun probably like four or five times straight just to make sure I got it down. I yes. mean, I was, I dove deep into this thing. Awesome. So, Hope before, you it. <laughs> oh, oh, we will definitely talk about that. But as a precursor, if I enjoyed it, the answer is, the answer is yes. Don't worry about that. Awesome. But as we get started, for everyone who knows you or might not know you i always like to start with this i'll let you introduce yourself with your name the band you're in what you do and then i'm gonna go like that like you know school thing where it's like and a little fun fact about yourself whatever the wackiest thing you can think of about yourself or some story or something because i've heard some crazy things like i've met one guy who was the biggest youtube star in sweden before pewdiepie and someone who has a famous instagram cat so i've heard a bunch of random things so i'll let you take it away matt uh, my name is Matt James. I'm the uh, lead singer of Blacktop Mojo. And uh, one funky fact about myself. Um, I don't know. I I play Xbox probably way too much every night. Yeah. Which game specifically? Uh, we play a lot of uh, Rainbow Six Siege and uh, Call of Duty and Rocket League. I mean, you name it. Me and me and all my friends, we, we game all the time. It's it's a good way to stay connected with your friends as well. I used to do that when I was like 13 or 14, but then my brother was always playing Call of Duty on our Xbox, so I had to find something else to do because he was basically right. hogging it the whole time. Damn you, Scott. But, oh, well, it got me into this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> there you and go. maybe a thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I want to get started off by really talking about your music, especially the kind of type of music and the influence that you go off on. Because when I was listening to it, I mean, really taking a deep dive into it, there's a huge mix of certain things in there. Like there's a post grunge influence in there. I could feel with certain like te- like certain emotions that are brought forth in the song, some classic rock, some metal. But the one thing that stuck out to me the most was like a southern rock feel. So when you guys were growing up, was this the kind of music that you were listening to that you were influenced by or... Basically, the, the question is, is how did you form the sound of Blacktop Mojo? Um, absolutely. Um, I think whenever I was teaching myself to sing, so uh, or in high school, when I, when I started singing, I, I wouldn't say teach myself to sing because I still have no idea exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. But um, in high school, whenever I would stay home alone or like when my parents would take uh, my little sister to softball or volleyball or whatever, you know, um, I would just sing at the top of my lungs in the 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 uh, songs that I would always try to, or the guy that I was tr- always try to emulate was, uh, was Sh- Brent Smith from Shinedown. Cause the, uh, leave a whisper had just come out, uh, not that long, um, before that. And that was what everybody kind of my age or in my class and in high school, that was kind of making its round, you know, on the blank CDs that everybody would be like, Oh, burn me that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so that's, I would always that those songs were always stuck in my head and that that was always what I was trying to you know always trying to hit the notes and and, and you know sing like that so I think uh that's where it kind of started for me and then um as I got older we I started getting into more music I didn't really get into get into music you know I grew up uh listening to pretty much what my parents listened to and uh that was about as far as it went you know I was never 
we grew up in the middle of nowhere, so there wasn't like record stores. There wasn't concerts coming through all the time, you know. So uh, I would always listen to my parents' classic rock stuff, you know, Van Halen, ACDC. Yes. <laughs> mom was mom was real into uh, hair metal and stuff. So you know, you got the Twisted Sister and the Quiet Riot and you know uh, Scorpions and stuff like that, you know. And uh, so there's a, definitely a lot of a uh, lot of that in my head somewhere, and. Uh, um, then, you know, growing up in the South, in the middle of nowhere in Texas, the only radio stations we got were country stations. So, I mean, we've got a lot of, a lot of, uh, old Willie Nelson, George Jones, Waylon Jennings, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So when I was going through it, I could really tell that there was some sort of hair metal vibe to it as well, because that's <laughs> what I grew up listening to. Cause my dad was big in a band. Like he loved Van Halen. Uh, he also loved ZZ Top and Poison. I still remember playing oh, like yeah. air guitaring with them in the basement with these loud tower speakers that probably like with how old I was, cause I was like three or four at this point with how loud we were playing them. Should Sammy Hagar have probably blown out my ears with his vocals? Yeah, probably, but it was well worth it because, you know, I'm just, as time oh, went on, all of a sudden, like, I started getting into other stuff as well, kind of like you, but I love kind of where you start out with, like, when you got into it with listening to Brent Smith from Shine Down because I did pick up a little bit of that in your vocal style as well, just in terms of some of how the, how the progressions of the vocals started going around and just listening to Shine Down, especially when their Attention Attention album came out, kind of matching a little bit up with what you guys did last year on Under the Sun. I can, I can tell that there's a good amount of Shine Down in there. And then when you're talking about the Southern, more Southern kind of influence in there, where you have a lot more of those, there'll be more like country influence in there because when you're growing up, like you said, radio stations in Texas, rural texas there's gonna be a lot of country it kind of also blends in a southern rock as well and i think i really kind of want to go deeper into that because i think that is one of the things that really sets your band apart from so many other bands in the scene right now because when i was growing up too it was my brother got really big in the southern rock especially leonard skinner i remember he'd go oh yeah he'd, he'd go bowling every single weekend for like a bowling league that he was in and he'd always wear the same thing he always wore these like black sweatpants and a leonard skinner shirt that said support southern rock on the back and he was just all into it so i kind of picked up on some of those vibes as well and it it really sticks out as like the a, a huge focal point as to why i think your band has had a lot of success in the past couple of years Thanks, man. Uh, definitely, definitely a lot of Southern rock in there. I mean, you can't grow up around here without listening to Leonard Skinner and 38 Special and, and you know, Blackfoot. And, uh, I mean, you name it, man. I mean, we we definitely, definitely are steeped in a lot of that, man. And that's good just because it comes from another. It's one thing I've always talked about with bands, too, is is when you're writing music and you're creating something, it always comes from a genuine place. And when you're mixing those influences that you had when you were growing up and those influences that you listened to, you can use those to create incredible sounds as well. And one thing, especially on the Under the Sun album and other albums I've heard you guys on, taking a look at it, it's that Southern rock, just kind of the way that, the way that it's uh, built and a little way that kind of the uh, melodies progress a little bit. That's a real big focal point in a lot of your songs, but it's sort of subtle. And the reason I really like that is because, again, it's such a standout point that you're not hearing from many other bands and especially in rock and metal right now. It's it's so unique compared to what a lot of other people are doing. So it kind of gives more of this like, oh, what's the best way to put it? I think I put it as like a is like a real rooted, a real down home kind of vibe. And I really do like that because I haven't really heard anything that prominent since bands like Leonard Skinner to 38 Special. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I think as a band, as a whole, I think we draw a lot on uh, grunge music as well. Like the, the the heavy stuff from the 90s, you know, your 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 Tool, your your Alice in Chains, your Soundgarden. Um, Chris Cornell is at, like I said, when I got into music later in life, that, that that was, or you know, when I was in college and stuff, that was a lot of my favorite stuff was, you know, the Chris Cornell, Temple of the Dog, uh, you know, Lane Staley with Alice in Chains and, and uh, you know, Mad Season and um, all those sorts of sounds, I think, kind of get thrown in there as well. So was there a real reason why when you were <laughs> grow when you were kind of going through college and when you were getting into more of that music, why you gravitate kind of towards that grunge post grunge style? Is there like a real reason behind it or is it just something that when you listen to it, you're just like you were just drawn to something like Chris Cornell's vocal style or just kind of yeah. how Tool built their songs? There's long standing progressions. Yeah, I think I just I think it's the right mix of of that that hair metal growing up and that and that soulfulness of that southern rock that you're talking about is it's all there you know they they 
they had such a melting pot of stuff that they drew drew on from that music. So uh, I think I was just kind of drawn to it. Every you know, every time you heard something by one of those bands, it was just like a little earworm that you couldn't really get out of your head. You're like, man, I got to listen to that again. So oh, totally understandable. And I, I where I can understand that too is is on on my end where I kind of grew up the same way again, listening to a lot of that hair metal, but being from uh northern state here in Wisconsin, it was something where especially with a you know, when the winter hits, it gets cold, it gets dark, everyone kind of gets a little bit antsy, a little bit angry. It, but the music I was trying to find was kind of like had that anger, but also had that same energy in there. So I ended up gravitating more towards punk rock, and it just became something that was huge for me. So just kind of again, if I were to make music. It'd probably be mostly more with punk, a punk rock bass because I love the energy. However, I can totally understand where you're coming from, where it just kind of has that certain vibe that you grew up around. So you're going to naturally gravitate a little bit more towards it. Not only that, but especially with someone like Chris Cornell, who had such an amazing voice for Audio Slave. I mean, come on. You, you can't beat that. You cannot get hooked into that, man. Yeah. No, it's like some of the first time I heard Chris Cornell, too. I was just like, I, I think it was Show Me How to Live. I was just like, what the hell is this this is insane yeah yeah he gets up there man he really gets up there it's something that just like sticks with you in your soul and obviously you just hear those some of him, him hit some of those high notes you're just like god damn this is good yeah absolutely brother <laughs> so let's so let's go even back further let's go to the formation of blacktop mojo so how did this band get formed in the end anyway because i know you guys have been around for a good amount of years so far but it's i always love to hear the origin story as well because that's something that there's a good amount of people that know it but there's also a good amount of people that really don't know the full story so i'm curious on this one um well i graduated college and i was working at a coffee shop here in palestine and uh started hanging around with some of the some of the local people around here and um anybody that's in a band can tell you that you know there was a point in time where you know if you're a guy that plays guitar if you're a guy that plays drums you know your friends are like hey uh this guy this guy can sing and this guy can play drums and you guys should start a band and um so it's kind of like that um me and me and our drummer nathan uh kind of ran in the same circles and it would always be like hey this guy plays drums and this guy sings like you guys should start a band and we always ran into each other at the bar and kind of wrote each other off for a while it was like okay yeah whatever you know and uh one night we just so happened to run into each other at a uh was at a cody johnson concert it was a country country concert up in uh up in Tyler and both of us were pretty hammered. And, uh, <laughs> uh, I was like, man, Hey, I'm, I'm playing, uh, I'm playing a set at the the coffee shop tomorrow, whatever. You should check it out. You should come by. And, uh, somehow he remembered, even though we were <laughs> pretty intoxicated and, uh, <laughs> we showed up the next day and, uh, he listened to my set and then he invited me back to his house and he had a, he had a drum set set up in his living room and, uh, he started playing and I was like, God damn, this guy can, this guy can beat the drums, you know? And, uh, so after that, we, we started drinking and, uh, just decided to start a band. We're like, Hey, let's, let's do this, man. And, uh, so that's kind of how we got started. <laughs> Alcohol is the elixir of a band formation. I'll tell you this. This ain't the first time I've heard something like this, but it seems like every time it happens, it just seems to work out incredibly well, especially when you have someone constantly telling you, hey, go like meet up with this guy, start a band with this. I think you guys would be good. And all of a sudden, kind of just you're seeing each other bar, kind of keep putting each other off. All of a sudden, you yeah. in one drunk super all of a sudden, it just sticks in your memory. It's just like that rep like repetition is the mother of all learning kind of thing where it's, yeah, it's just going to get yeah. drilled into your head. And all of a sudden, you take a chance. You're like, hey, I'm playing this set at this coffee shop. Come on and check it out. And all of a sudden, he shows up. And next thing you know, then you go jam with him at his house. And now you've got the formation of the band starting already right then and there. Yep. That was pretty much it, man. And then we <laughs> we invited uh, – there was uh, our first guitar player, Kenneth Irwin. Uh, I went to high school with him, and he was always in – I had kept in touch with him, but I remember he was always in metal bands and stuff. And uh, and I, I knew he could shred and, and play guitar a little bit. And so we invited him out and it was just the three of us at first. And the owner of the coffee shop would, would, uh, basically give us the keys and just kind of let us sit in, sit in the coffee shop after hours and jam out. And, um, eventually we, we kept doing that. And eventually he started inviting people in and we started inviting people in. So then it would just turn into these parties after hours at the coffee shop. I remember one night, um, they were catering a, a wedding or something. And, uh, 
the wedding reception was over, but they still had a, a keg left over. So they brought the keg in and <laughs> we had a, we had a keg party and just played a bunch of random, you know, a bunch of random shit that we knew. And everybody was, it was a good time. And, uh, I wouldn't call that our first gig by any means, but that was, that was, that was kind of how everything got started was just jamming and partying, man. <laughs> Man, alcohol is the center of everything with this. I absolutely it love it, it especially me being the big beer drinker that I am. <laughs> Seems to be a pattern here, I guess. Yeah. It, it it really does, but I but that's kind of a really cool story in the end as well, due to the fact that you kind of had your own practice space for a little bit, due to the fact that you worked at a coffee shop and the owner also believed in you enough to say, "Hey, here's the keys." You guys can practice, hang out, and then all of a sudden, it slowly starts forming up where more people are starting to show up, more people starting to listen to your music, and then you get like a, I'll call it like a proxy first gig where all of a sudden, it's just a random thing where so, they cater wedding, and all of a sudden, they bring back a keg, woohoo for yeah. kegs, because they're yeah. all, they always bring a good time. I've never seen a, someone have a bad time around a keg. Nope. I don't think I have either, unless you drink too much of the keg. <laughs> but. but but then you go away from the keg and have the bad time because I've, right, I, right. I, I've done keg stands on a party bus before. And I'll, I'll tell you what, that might not have been my best idea overall. But now I look back and think, yeah, that was a pretty good idea in the end. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I did that. Yeah, I'm glad I did because I always think about it. I'm just like, this was fun as all hell. Yeah. 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 So, so, so kind of with that being like your proxy first gig where all of a sudden, you know, you, you get a keg, there are people there listening to you guys jam out and really getting your music. And all of a sudden that must have been kind of the launching point to start getting you guys to go out more, play live music, play some more live shows, especially in your local area. So what were some of those first live shows like? Because I always love hearing how wacky and crazy some of these first live shows can get, whether it's like they're just absolutely incredible or sometimes, you know, so like kind of like everyone, like a comedian, like they just bomb out of nowhere. I always love hearing these random stories as well because it, it's all about building character as a band as well. Right. Um, our first show that I remember playing, uh, it was the three of us. And then we invited a buddy of ours that ran sound and also played a little bit of bass. And uh, we played on a flatbed trailer um, at this uh, local high school's fall fest. Uh, like they had the, like a spring or like a spring fling, but you know, during Halloween, you know, so they had like a haunted house there and uh, they just put us up on this flatbed trailer and let us play for like 30 minutes or 45, however long we could play at that point. And uh, I remember doing that. And then our first like official full band gig where we had like a a full time bass player and everything uh, was at our local bar here, um, the Shelton gin uh, on December 21st, 2012, which is the, the day that the world was supposed to end. <laughs> I um, remember that. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the first, first, first actual show was the day the world was supposed to end. So I'm not sure that the world didn't end and we're just kind of living in this weird dream world. Uh, no, but, uh, uh, it was, it was a good time, man. Uh, the bar owner, it was the first time I remember getting paid to play and, and, uh, it was pretty cool, man. It must have been an incredible feeling too, just getting that first time all of a sudden you're getting money for doing what you love and yeah. just kind of feeling that euphoria of emotion where it's like, this is at, this is becoming a real, this is a tangible thing, especially, but then again, you never know, it might not necessarily be a real thing because it did happen on the supposed end of the world. We might be living in the matrix right now. I don't know. Where's, where the hell's, well, well, I mean, Keanu Reeves is really prevalent right now. He might be Neo again. He might come to save us. I have no idea what's going on. We don't know. We don't know. I don't, know, but, I, don't, I don't know, but now, I mean, Bill and Ted Save the World is about to come out. I mean, and John Wick is a huge thing. You're coming out with another Matrix. I mean, I, he might be just like Neo again, but just like taken for himself. I, I don't know. I wouldn't be mad at it. I wouldn't be mad at it. <laughs> Neither would I. <laughs> Neither would I, because I think that'd be absolutely hilarious. But so now it's like your band's starting to pick up a lot more steam you're starting to play these gigs more around your hometown but all of a sudden it's got there's got to be a point where it starts to expand as well due to the fact that i mean taking a look at you guys right now i mean you came out with a huge album in 2019 and you've been you're playing festivals over the place especially with what my buddy was talking about to me with you guys playing at rock usa here in oshkosh wisconsin in 2019 and it being one of his favorite sets of the whole entire night where he remembers your guitar player playing the playing the guitar behind his head and him just sitting there just like how in the hell is he doing that? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, it started picking up after that. We started playing, we basically just played, uh, bar gigs wherever we could get them around, around here, which there was a lot of, you know, honky tonks and stuff. A lot of, uh, 
a lot of places where, you know, we'd play for four or five hours at a time and just play covers and, um, you know, 45 minutes on 15 minute breaks, you know, that, that type of thing. And, uh, same way a lot of bands get started. Um, but it was a lot of country bars. So it was a lot of, we had a lot of country covers that we were playing and, and stuff like that. So, um, Cause there was always that one guy in the cowboy hat that would walk up and be like, do you guys know any George Strait or, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that. And, um, we did that for a while. And when we started writing our first album, uh, I am, uh, it, it was all pretty heavy rock. It was nothing, it was nothing like the, the country stuff that we'd been playing. So, um, we decided once we recorded that album, basically to, to be a rock band. So, um, uh, but being a rock band in the middle of nowhere, East Texas is, uh, not as feasible as you might think. Um, it's about as feasible as you might think. So we, we had to start traveling out to play these rock clubs in Dallas or, or Houston or, uh, you know, Austin or places like that. And, uh, so we started doing that for a little while and, uh, we picked up the attention of our, of our first manager. Um, and, uh, that was right around the time that we were getting ready to, to record our second album in, uh, 2016. And, uh, we all moved into a house together. We all decided to quit our day jobs. And, uh, that's why we called that record burn the ships. Cause it was ba- basically like, this is our, this is our no looking back moment type of thing. So, uh, we all moved into a house and then two weeks later we drove out to Nashville and recorded our second record. And, um, it had our, had our first radio single on it and our, uh, our cover of dream on which started picking up traction on YouTube and, um, right around that time as well. So, um, it was all kind of a perfect storm of, of opportunities for us. Right. Yeah. right around. And right now that cover of dream on is your most popular song on Spotify. As I look with, at it right now with more than 8 million streams at this current moment when we were shooting. So, and plus, I mean, my buddy was one that sent me, he's like, dude, you got to listen to this cover of dream on. It is intense. I'm like, all right, let's see what you go. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, this is my buddy that he's pretty much never steered me wrong once. Every time he sends me something, I'm like, okay, this is going to be good. <laughs> and he sends me this one. I'm like, okay, let's check this. Oh my God, this is good as all hell. No wonder why. <laughs> well, big thank you to your buddy there, man. <laughs> and one other thing, too, is like, I love the fact that he called it Burn the Ships as well because it does have that no look back moment. And that's the kind of point where it's you're putting, you're going all in on yourself as well. You're going all in as a band. And it, it's, clearly was the right move especially with the fact that you have three albums on your belt right now and you're doing incredibly well for yourself it's not gonna lie i mean taking a look at your spotify monthly listeners right now you're over a quarter of a million per month which is absolutely insane compared to a lot of other bands that i i've seen that have had more like radio play but it's just like they're not really hitting that mark where you guys are hitting that mark consistently every single time and then when it comes to burn the ships the one thing i really want to ask about this one is what was it like living in a house together with the rest of your band and creating this record? Because I haven't really heard of anybody just kind of like lock themselves in a house together and just really work on something like this. Um, well, we all still live together um, still to this day. So I mean, oh, no way. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's worked out pretty well. I guess <laughs> we haven't killed each other yet. That's a, I was gonna say, my God, I didn't know that you guys still all live together. That's that have been like that's almost that's four years. Jesus. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, we we did that for two records straight now. So just basically writing mm-hmm. and recording and doing the thing, man. I think you guys should do this from now on, though, especially with the way your most recent record turned out, because it 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 really shows that there's such a camaraderie and such a chemistry between you guys that the fact that you're all living together and you really focus on this. So everyone kind of knows the ins and outs, how each member of the band works, how each member of the band operates so that when, you know, maybe someone has a little bit of a different idea or different influence they want to work with on a certain song. Then you guys have enough inherent ability to uh, trust that person with, okay, let's give it a shot. It might not necessarily work out in the end, but let's give it a shot. Let's see how this works. And let's see if there's like a certain piece of this cert- a melody, certain piece of, the, of a course you're trying to create that might just stick out. It's like, okay, we don't want to go with that whole entire idea, but we're going to take this piece and try and create something else around it because it just sticks out so much in our minds. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely exactly how it works, man. Um, we've always created in a room together and uh i don't think we'll ever 
figure out another way to do that. Um, I know a lot of bands have success nowadays because there's so much uh, technology and it's very easy to be in different places and create. Um, but for us, I think that being in a room and that just you know, kind of getting in a circle and, and uh, that trust that we have in each other of, of kind of like, like you said, hey, let's run with this idea real quick and let's see where it goes. Um, I think that's that's the best way for us, for sure. I'll say one thing I will say about that is make sure as time goes on that you continue to do that because as time goes on, yes, lives lives are going to change. You know, people may come into your lives, come out of your lives. Someone might get married, someone might have kids. But when it comes to the creative process, make sure all you guys are in a room together and working on this together because taking a look again at the product that you guys are putting out there with your music and how real and how emotional it is with that Southern rock vibe. Holy crap. You guys got to keep doing this every step of the way. Like, do not deviate from this album construction style. Yes, sir. You got it, man. <laughs> I don't think we will. I, I I hope you don't because, again, every time, like when I was going through Under the Sun, like again, going through like four or five different times and then just really diving deep in each song, I'm just sitting here thinking, you got to be kidding me. How, how, how are they doing this? <laughs> <laughs> how are they blending all these like different intricate styles together and just making them all work so well together? really matching all these different emotions that the instrumentals are trying to bring out using your vocals to match those uh, feelings as well. And just also match all these different pacings to really create all these forceful songs that really just stand out over almost any other thing I've heard this year. Even though, again, this record came out last year, I've heard a lot of good music this year, but I haven't heard something that really has a feeling like this. Well, thank you, brother. So uh, let's let's dive deep in this album because I'm really interested to see what it was about. So what was the focal point behind the Under the Sun album? Like, what did you guys write about? Because I did go into the lyrics a little bit, or actually not a little bit, a lot of it. And it seems like there's a lot of talk about different relationships with people and different relationships with, within yourself that are, that's talked about on this album. So um, the main theme behind Under the Sun was uh, there was a – a Bible verse where King Solomon is talking about, uh, you know, King Solomon in the Bible is a, is a, is a wise man. And he, he went through a lot of the same follies that we all go through in our, in our lives, especially as you know, I'm, I'm 28. Um, so, you know, I'm still making a lot of mistakes and a lot of those same mistakes with, you know, with, with drinking, with women, with relationships, with things like that. And, uh, so, uh, that, the title track has the line in it, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, it it just means, you know, we all make the same mistakes. We're not special. You know, everybody has to learn the same lessons, you know, and most of the time we have to learn those lessons the hard way. So, I mean, that's kind of what it's all about there. Very understandable. I kind of, and just taking a look at the lyrics, I kind of was taking a little more of a literal approach to and kind of taking a different life, but I can easily see where that is coming in as well. One other thing, too, is when you brought up King Solomon, that kind of did light off a little bit of light in my head as well, because I mean, I'm, I'm only 25, so I'm making kind of those same mistakes with women, with drinking, with some, with certain relationships with friends as well, just kind of just certain foibles, of course, in life. When you brought up King Solomon as well, I mean, I grew up in a Catholic grade school. I went to a Catholic high school, so a lot of that stuff is still, I can still like remember exactly what these stories are oh, yeah. about. So when you brought up King Solomon, I'm like, I have not heard that in a long time. You're really digging deep in my brain here, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're trying man yeah i mean we grew up in the bible belt so it's definitely uh it was definitely a large part of our our raising and uh our coming up so yeah my, and my mom's side of the family was is primarily polish and that's a very big catholic community as well so it was i mean pretty much pretty much was like okay that was ingrained in me from the beginning due to my grandma and grandpa with their faith as well and then i kind of passed down from my, to my mom and then all of a sudden it kind of went towards my brother and myself as well whereas now we're kind of off on our own we're really i'm not really as big in as big focus into that anymore there's certain things and certain ideas that i have but again it's something where it's like whenever i because i've talked to many bands that have those christian influence as well i've talked to two previous ones including bands like uh relent who's out of texas well i believe they're out of san antonio in a band called The Protest. So it's I, I do understand a lot of these as well. I understand why that like those messages can really bring forth a lot of power in music as well. So kind of bring up that King Solomon thing. I'm just like, dang, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, man. I think it no matter what you believe or whatever, you know, you don't have to be a uh, heavily into any kind of religion to really uh you know garner a lesson from 
from the lessons in the, in the book, you know what I mean? I mean, it's uh, they, they're pretty common themes throughout everybody's lives, no matter where you're living or, or how you grew up or what you believe. So um, we thought it was, a, you know, it's a pretty solid theme. Exactly. And it, it makes a lot of sense and it really will stick out with a lot of people as well, especially with the way this, all these songs are constructed as well. But when you, when you start out with, cause you said that you kind of had that start out right away with a song like laid on me and your first, with the first song in the album. So when you were writing this one, what was the inspiration behind the sound of it? And what was really the feeling behind when you guys were writing this and what stuck out to you the most? Because again, I did a deep dive on this. I want to see if what I thought about this song really stuck out the same time as well. Um, so lay it on me it comes from uh, basically just having this this secret from the from the person that you're or you know you can you can kind of tell the whole album kind of goes back and forth between the, the relationship between these these two people um, and in this one in particular it's like you know something's wrong um, but the other person's just not saying it you know what I mean and. Uh, it's about that release of, of them finally saying it and you finally understanding where they're coming from and, um, you know, just getting it out in the open, you know, which is, which is the hardest part sometimes. Yeah. And also having that feeling that you can trust someone to tell them what's going on, whether it might be good or bad as well. Cause I mean, I went through a relationship about three years ago where the, it was kind of like an inability to really talk about something that was major in our lives that was going to affect us a year later down the line. I mean, that was something that personally I didn't do very well at it all because that kind of tanked everything. But listening to it, it's like I can kind of take part of them like, damn, I really messed that one up. Oh, well, <laughs> it's life. What are you going to do? Live and learn, brother. Live and learn. Exactly. And when I dove deep into this one, like I always I always started like focusing on the instrumentals and the vocals, and then kind of wrapping up all together because I really like to dive deep into that. And listening to the instrumentals, I really like the intro on this one because you had a lower tune guitar strumming with like one long note with this pounding marching drums that kind of built up with lower tune strums coming in. And then you guys went this full on intro with everything like classic rock through and through. And it did it with like a nice consistent pace, but not like a super fast pace. But what you did was you made everything hit so hard. It gets you right into the song and right in this album from the get go was the perfect way to intro it and the perfect way to just blast into this album. And one band that it reminded me of that kind of brought forward that kind of style was Alter Bridge. Yeah, uh, we're big fans of Alter Bridge. So um, our guitar player especially is a big, uh, largely heavily influenced by Mark Germani and his playing. Um, so I'm, it's cool that you picked up on that, man. That, that was something I really picked up with along this whole entire album as well from your guitarist because there was a lot of pieces where I'm like, this makes me feel like there's like a Mark Tremonti feel to it. Like there really is, there really was a lot of it. And I'm, I thought their album Walk the Sky last year was the best album of the year, just how everything was constructed. I got to see them before everything got shut down. And I still remember because like I'm always going to concerts where I'm getting into mosh pits, I'm getting bounced around left and right. That's just my style. <laughs> Watching Alter Bridge, I'm like, okay, I'm definitely not going to get a mosh pit. I got to find some way to really enjoy this concert otherwise and really focus on the music. My eyes were stuck on Mark Tremonti playing the guitar, just thinking, I don't even know how to play guitar, so I'm really confused by this whole entire thing. And then <laughs> there's that, right? Right. <laughs> it's <laughs> he's he's pretty incredible, man. They're they're an incredible live band too, man. I, I've seen them. Uh, Saw them open up for uh, who, who was it? Breaking Benjamin and Disturbed, I think. Uh, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> a couple of years back in Dallas, and uh, that was definitely one of the best parts of the night was watching them play. So, and then that's that's also including like Breaking Benjamin and Disturbed in there as well, who also always put on incredible sets, especially with Ben oh, Burnley's yeah. cert- vocal prowess. And then you get to Disturbed, where they ca- they go with those classic like faster paced songs, those more new metal, then also mix more metal. But you get David Dream with this just certain prophetic voice that just sticks out so oh, yeah. <laughs> so much and i mean there disturb was my favorite band when i was in middle school like that was the one where my uh, teachers in my middle school because it was a catholic middle school were thinking like is this kid the devil and me bringing in a disturbed <laughs> cd one day that that didn't go over very well because it was the indestructible album and apparently they didn't like inside the fire but right. oh well you were down with the sickness <laughs> I, I was down i've been down with the sickness since i was 12 <laughs> what are you gonna do what, what are you gonna do but going back into <laughs> late on me when I listen to the verses, you kind of had this like slower overall pace with the drums and the guitar style was more down tuned. And personally, I really like this because you gave the song this hard rock feel, but also this like post grunge heaviness that 
it kind of just kept us feeling like we were getting like a heavier song in our hands, not only with the sound, but emotionally as well. So it really kind of also brought you in more off of that like blast in the intro to something more. It's like, okay, now your emotions are starting to get into it through that first verse. And it just stuck out to me like a sore thumb, but a sore thumb in a good way. Yeah, well, it's definitely an, uh, definitely an emotional song. And uh, like I said, it's about that release. So uh, I think, you know, the way the music's kind of arranged is kind of reflects that you know everything crashing down and and bursting out in the open you know it does especially when you get to the chorus well because you have it like as i looked at it, i thought it was full of classic hard rock glory where everything is brought to the forefront it's loud and in your face but it's not like overbearing at the same time and i love how you use the melodies that have been influenced by like southern rock and this because they you pull on this create this hard-hitting sound that has this feel that's more rooted in the truth of what you're trying to talk about at the same time as well and i know i spoke about it earlier where i see that as kind of the thing that really especially instrumentally and construction your songs that really helps your band stick out more than a lot of other bands in the genre right now is that Southern rock influence on a chorus like this. It really sticks out through those melodies. And I really enjoyed how that all played together, especially when you mix in how the intro sound of the verses and then the chorus to really kind of bring it all together. Then you get that guitar solo where it had like this higher pitch notes and they stood out over the heavier drumming that brought that classic rock diversity to the track. And I thought it was a great move on your guys' part to put this song together the way you did. Thanks, bro. Now, should I talk about you and how your vocal sounded? Uh, be gentle, brother. <laughs> well, there was a certain vocalist that your style on this song reminded me of a lot, and it fit it perfectly. And the vocalist that really stuck in my mind, I'm like, there's a little bit of, there's an influence here. I'm going back to Alter Bridge with Miles Kennedy on this one. I'll take that, dude. Miles is, <laughs> Miles is one of the best singers out there. Don't. Oh, yeah, it's incredible to hear him, yes. especially it's kind of funny, like when you can hear him talk for the first time, like just normally he kind of sounds like he's like a he's going to be running like IT for a big tech company or something like that. Or just like for like some company that they need, you know, like an IT master. Then all of a sudden you hear him sing, you're just like, that is not the guy I thought it was. Very, very unassuming. Definitely. Very unassuming, but it's awesome. And then taking a look at how your vocals remind me of it. When we got to the verses, again, if I keep looking over, it's just because I have a huge note sheet and it might be reading <laughs> off it, but I want to make sure I get this right. You're good, I, saw, I thought in the verses, you had this like slightly higher pitch that I'm used to hearing in hard rock a lot, but it was the perfect contrast with that post grunge heaviness that you allowed both the instrumentals with that post grunge feel and also those vocals to really just stick out together in contrast it wasn't where the contrast was too far apart from each other where it was going to hinder the other thing it was it was far apart enough to the point where both the instrumentals and the vocals were going to be amped up and more prominently shown because of that contrast sure sure and then the chorus you hit some of those incredibly high notes and i like how this is done to mix more of that vocal style in with the verses because you match the loud power of the instrumentals here and you have a bit of like a Southern rock flow them as well. And you just stick out again, like a sore thumb. I said already, but it's in a good way. So trust me on that. It was, <laughs> I'll take that brother. And then kind of just wrapping this song up for everybody overall, how I look at this, this is a great like first dive into the album. I love how the band mixes this post grunge, heavy emotion, with the classic rock instrumentation and Southern rock melodies. It sticks out both as heavy in your face, but also rooted at home at the same time. Matt's vocals remind me of Miles Kennedy with the range as well. Not just as high, just not as high as like Miles Kennedy would go. But damn, does his flow fit these Southern Rock melodies so well. So when people are trying to listen to this album, if you start out with that, God damn, you guys picked a good one to start out with. Thanks, brother. And I mean, I kind of just wanted to go deep dive in that because the song was, again... Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you, should we go through a couple more? Because, I mean, I've, I, I did all of them. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Alrighty, So we're going to go with another one that I can take a look at the ones that I highlighted. That I really wanted to go over because I highlighted the the, uh, the names of some of these. <laughs> Don't worry about that. But <laughs> when, um, third one, Come Get Your Coat. What, what was this song really rooted in? And what was the construction behind this one? What was the inspiration? Because this one was interesting to me. And... After looking at my notes and looking at what we kind of talked about earlier, man, it really is interesting even more. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So this one started out um, again with a lot of alcohol. Um, yes. Yes. Our, our, our bass player, uh, Kat and I were sitting on our, our patio. And uh, it's one of the benefits of living together is we're never, never far apart from each other. And we were sitting on the patio with a bunch of people just picking around on guitar. And he started playing like the, the main riff, I guess, of that song. And uh, 
somewhere in my drunken stupor, I just said, uh, come get your coat. You left it last night when you snuck over <laughs> here. And then that's basically, that's all we had of that song for the longest time until we all got together and really started hammering out, you know, the writing on the, on this album. And, uh, so that, that's where that one started. And it was basically, I, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where, uh, you had a one night stand and then you get that awkward text the next day of like, uh, Hey man, you, you left your, your coat over here. You left your hat over here or whatever, you know? And, uh, so that's, that's kind of where this song took shape from. Fortunately enough, I've never been in that situation, <laughs> but that's kind of because I've never left anything over there. And if I did, I kind of, and if, if for Lucky some reason you. I did, it was probably something I didn't really care about. And they're like, oh, we probably just not going to text him anyway. So I probably didn't even know if I lost it or not. It probably was like something like, I left like a sock over there or something. It had a hole in it. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> But that's that's really that's interesting to hear because I, that was kind of one thing I was wondering about. Like, what was this really about? Because it could I thought it was something about like a cheating couple and realizing like the person in the middle of it shouldn't be a part of it anymore. That's what I thought it was about. I didn't think it was about like a, just like a one night stand where you get that feeling like, oh, shoot, I left something over there. I definitely uh, the story. Probably. Uh, there's three people in the story for sure. Um, but Ooh, then I kind of was right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think the the inspiration behind it um from my personal life was a uh, uh, a girl left some stuff over it at my house in my room and uh i had to i had to make that awkward text of like hey Ooh. what do you want me to do with this stuff but yeah um so yeah it turned it into a song you know <laughs> Hey, sometimes some of the some everyone turns up into songs that of things that happen in their lives or stuff. Like, take a look at like uh, artists as, or artists. I was gonna say authors as well, and they write stories. A lot of times when they write fiction, it's like, well, how do you come up with this stuff? Well, I had an interesting childhood, or I just take stuff from my life that was crazy and just put it in there. It's same thing with you on this song as well. You took something from your life that you know is an interesting story and it's kind of potentially impacted you in some way. I'm not sure how, but. If you put it into a song and you kind of came up with the idea in a drunken stupor, and I always like the thing where it's like when you're talking when you're drunk, like it's a lot of the only honesty comes out because your filter is turned off, but so the truth yeah. just kind of comes out. So I do like the fact this was brought out. And when I dove into the song, the intro, oh my god, I gotta ask you about this. Were you guys thinking about Van Halen when you wrote this song? Because the intro stuck out like this was like a Van Halen kind of riff. Oh, um, it yes, yeah, definitely got that hair metal feel to it, but uh. I think the the intro came from it was just such a weird timing in the in the verse with the the phrasing of that of that one line um, and really wanted to keep that one line in there that we that we had because that's where it started and uh, so that that intro just sort of lent itself to that to that strange kind of timing which which is kind of cool because that whole song's about being disoriented you know that next morning when you're hungover and trying to find your jacket i guess it, it really it really does work out as well because when you're thinking about like a van halen style guitar you're always thinking of eddie van halen with the interesting distortion that always made you kind of feel like you know your head's trying to wrap around like how do you make that sound especially i was talking to my dad about this as well just because again he's big van halen back in the 80s kind of thinking about okay when it comes to eddie van halen like how do you make this work how do you make this sound? how do you make these crazy distortions work and play with that kind of a speed so again you're kind of getting your head kind of a little bit of a daze a little bit of a headache as well because you're like how the heck does that work? However, it there was a little bit of a different style to it as well because it reminded. It, I thought of it as like a post grunge Eddie Van Halen, and I love how it sticks out with that shredding distortion because it gives also a certain emotion to it as well that really fits the song. And this stands out like something I haven't heard in a long and really ever. Like especially with the mixture of it, it was something that I remember just when I first put it on. I was thinking, wait, 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 they did what? Yeah. Is, is this a thing? I, get, I think I played this song, the intro back like 10 or 11 times. I'm like, I, I got to see if I get this right. I got to see if this is a thing. I'm like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm really picking up on this. This is nuts. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, that's we are very fortunate to have two very talented guitar players that uh, basically when they're writing, do nothing but sit with a guitar for eight hours a day and and, and figure stuff like that out. So um, I don't know where they came <laughs> up with it, but they. They came up with it. So <laughs> they came it. up with it. And that dedication that they have to, to really work on their craft absolutely shows, especially in that in the song like this with that intro, because my my God, I mean, 
when you work with that sort of like distortion, especially like the Eddie, Han- Eddie Van Halen style distortion, it's so hard to match it up with so many other different styles as well. Just do the fact that it's so synonymous with that hair metal, more upbeat rock kind of style that the 80s had. However, yeah. they did it in this one, especially more of a post grunge, more more deeper kind of feel to it. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> if, if you guys haven't heard this one yet, you, you have to. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> As, as I kind of went through with it, I looked at the verses and you played it with a more slower pace rock sound with the drums keeping that pace. The guitar was also working with the same distortion and it's a transition in the verse itself. So you kind of had like these certain transitions that the guitar is working with that distortion. And initially, I honestly, I was kind of open for something that was a little bit faster pace. But after going through the song a couple of times, it just I just thought that faster pace wouldn't really fit the song overall. And you made a good move here because it allows a great transition from that intro to the verses and then from the verses into the chorus as well. So at first I was like, wait, this doesn't seem like it was, it it would be the right move. And all of a sudden after two or three times, I'm thinking, Oh boy, I was wrong. They actually stuck with this and it was the correct thing to do. (laughs) Well, thank God for that, man. (laughs) Oh, oh, thank God as well. Cause you guys created a kick-ass song with this one because then all of a sudden you get to the chorus and it reminded me, Again, I'm going to go back to what I saw. I talked about the last one. It reminded me of something that like an in- Alter Bridge kind of influenced as well because it was hard rock. It had the melodic Southern rock feel to it overall. But specifically like this, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, it's a precursor for the next section because it mixes very well with the style of vocals that you had on the chorus, and it just stuck out. So it just enhanced everything on it as well. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but again, that was something that I really did like. But then you go to the the bridge and you get more of that consistent strum on the guitar and it's building anticipation more of like a shredding solo and then again i got the shredding solo from that eddie van halen feel once again the one thing i'll say about this is is in the solo from the first part of the solo i thought that it should be like it was the volume of it was a little bit low compared to like what you had in the outro with the song because he brought it back and it was just full force and i thought it could have been full force on both ends again this is my personal opinion i'm just kind of spitball on this i don't get don't get me wrong i love the instrumentation on this one that was like the one thing if i'm being real nitpicky that'd be the one thing i'm like okay i'd kind of increase the volume on that solo in the in the like the like at the end of the bridge up and then you get to the chorus and the outro it's amp the volume of that solo is amped up and i really was like holy crap this is what i was hoping for and it, get, oh, and it kind of ends the song perfectly I'm like yes yes <laughs> that's definitely a fun one live too um just seeing uh, Chuck and, and, and Kiefer, you know, trading back and forth on those solos is, is one of my favorite parts of the show for sure. I'm hoping that was the one that my buddy told me about where they were playing the guitar behind their head and actually doing it because that would be intense. It might have been. It might have been. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to bring it up to him after this and be like, was it come get your coat? If he says yes, I'm just going to be like, I freaking <laughs> talked about that. Man. Man. Yeah. yeah. Get super excited. And then. I precursored it, but now we're going into your vocals as well. And you, again, you do it so well because in the verses, you sing with this more of like a drawn out style that really does match all well that slower pace. And because it allows that cell guitar to really drive into the chorus. So again, like I was talking about at the first time I heard, I'm like, oh, I kind of wish it would go a little bit faster pace in the chorus or the verse is my bad. But when we go into it, it just again, just kind of just ooh, fits so damn well just like my god this actually works out incredible and the chorus again you remind me of miles kenny with a little bit of like a lower like a little bit of a lower tone to it you're not going as high as he does but it fits so well again with the pacing and the melodies that you have in that chorus they just stick out so well and it just is such an impactful part of the song and hearing the origin of it you can really tell that that emotion you're using in those vocals is really what helps these vocals stand out completely on this song so yeah <laughs> well thank you man you did a good one i i i, I as i kind of put especially with the bridge and the outro i again i this was kind of cemented as i thought one of your best and just a hard rock banger of epic proportions so yeah i think you guys did a crazy good job on this one and yeah i'm gonna say crazy good because i think that really fits the epicness of the whole entire thing <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> plus it's kind of it's kind of funky as well there yeah. there was specifically one song i did want to talk about because there was a certain influence on it that i thought i heard but i kind of want to hear what you have to say about it and I really want to jump into it, and it was uh, The Lashing. That one was something that stuck out to me because it was a lot different than a lot of the other songs on the album. So what was the inspiration behind this one? 
Um, the inspiration behind this, uh, I've had a lot of, uh, I've never had the best luck with, uh, with women or like expressing how I feel about, uh, women and kind of, uh, that, that shyness, I guess, of like, you know, you can either say something or, uh, you know, you can fade away, you know, um, that's kind of, that's kind of that theme of that song. And, uh, you know, the lashing kind of is, a you know, you say that thing and they're either, you know, at least you said it, you know, whether you get punished for it or, or not, you know what I mean? Oh, totally understandable. And that's what, whether you and, get embarrassed or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally understandable. Cause I kind of, I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way for a while. I was that exact same kind of way where it was, I was never had the best luck. I always had trouble actually like vocalizing my feelings basically and being like, comfortable hey, with I saying like it. you but you know yeah it was kind of like uh like it was it was like a little kid in the playground just going up just going hi and then just running away <laughs> pretty much yeah yeah pretty much and then all of a sudden like in college at the bars all of a sudden, like my friend's like yeah yeah go and talk to that girl i'm just like eh, but do i really want to and my excuse uh, is always oh i'm just enjoying my time i'm drinking my beer kind of thing but um yeah yeah, they always gave me crap for that, too, because always when we walked into this one bar, we would walk in and they would always go to the bar to get drinks. But when at the entrance, there was always this one girl and she always had like a tub of beer in front of her. And they're always going to get mixed drinks. I just wanted a beer, basically. So what I would do is is I would buy one from her. And then because she was sitting up on like a windowsill, like in front of the, like in front of this tub, they actually would let me go up and sit next to where my buddies were going to get drinks. So I, and I just talk with her to shoot the shit, whatever happened. And then all there of a sudden, go. when they come back, I'd already have one beer down and I'd have my second one ready to go. Like, this was the perfect way to go about it. Absolutely. But it was like, but it was like you're so you're like so comfortable there. But all of a sudden you get out away from that. And you're just like. Uh, what am I supposed to do here? Am, am I supposed I don't to, know talk? What to do with my hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm literally with Cricky Bobby. Like, I, I don't know what to do with my hands. The, <laughs> yeah. the, the car, the, the car ran well. You can put your hands up. The, 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 the car, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what it was like. I was like Ricky Bobby in his first interview. <laughs> there you go. And now I'm like Ricky Bobby in his middle interviews. Like, let me tell you yeah. something. I'm the best there is, plain and simple. I wake up in the morning, not piss excellence. <laughs> Hey, that's where we all want to be, man. <laughs> it really took a turn, and there was a specific inspiration that I heard, that I thought I heard on the song, and it was something that stuck out to me like none other. And the inspiration I thought was from the artist formerly known as Prince. Yeah, yeah, it, it was something that was in, interesting because when I listened to the instrumentals intro, it had more like this hard rock ballad feel to it slower pacing the guitar saying like a higher pitch and i really like the idea of the intro because you use the higher pitch to make it stand out then initially when i jumped into the verses i'm like and they kind of leave more to be desired however after going through the song the whole entire time i can see why you went with more like a minimal instrumentation on this out because it gives the song a feel that you can't ignore then when you get to the chorus it was again my feelings were confirmed because the slower pacing more melodic tone just lets the vocals play the contrasting pacing makes me think like this is a blacktop mojo's taking on their sound and blending it with prince you got to the guitar so i'm like okay they definitely had to blend this with like a prince feel because it is absolutely insane and one thing i have to say about that is when it comes to an artist like prince it's so unique it's so different it's constructed in a certain way and when people try and kind of blend it into a certain sound especially with their sound i've heard a lot of people try and do it and i've heard a lot of people not do it well i'll put it that way this was definitely not one of those common songs like i listen i'm just thinking it's incredibly hard to blend it however what you did your homework on the melodies and how the vocal patterns can contrast the instrumentation and the pacing just to create a powerful song that was like a black top mojo meets a prince kind of melody a prince kind of purple rain ballad feel and i was just sh- I almost said chat there. That'd be bad. <laughs> but I pretty much just like at the end of it, like when I was going through it, I sat there and I was just kind of shook by it due to the fact that I couldn't believe that it worked out so damn well. Like I, Again, it was something where I'm like, I, I swear I could have been listening to Prince, especially with your vocal patterns on this one, because I find it incredible that you're able to use these different tones and different pacings overall throughout the whole entire song, kind of like what Prince would have done on Purple Rain. And it just gives an incredible feel and just power to the song. I'm like, I swore I could have been listening to like the hard rock version of Prince here. Nothing wrong with being compared to Prince, brother. <laughs> no, nothing. I'm, I'm, just, I'm curious. Have you ever heard someone bring up that idea to you, especially on a song like this? Um, not Prince, man. But uh, no, I'll take that. I think uh, 
for us personally, I think it was probably more like a like an old blues type of type of influence type of vibe for us. Uh, less instrumentation, like you're talking about, where it's uh, you just kind of let the honesty of, of what you're talking about kind of carry you through. And uh, but I can I can see where you're getting the purple rain vibes from now that you now that you bring that up. Uh, yeah. So you're not the first one I've ever shocked with a comparison to something where it's like, I never thought of that, but now I think about it, it's like, yeah, that actually kind of works. But when you're talking about using blues as well with more of that minimal instrumentation and also trying to just bring out a certain emotion with it, especially with the vocals as well, where you're talking about a much deeper story, a much deeper personal thing that's going on as well. I mean, that's really where you're going to get those songs that really amplify the emotion. And when you're singing about it, especially when it's personal to you, it just comes out with such a different vigor, comes out with such a different like ambition to it where you're trying to tell this story. You're trying to tell people what's going on. And just again, when you're really being honest about it, it's just that's when the emotion really comes out and it really stands out. I've heard a lot of times that I'm not going to lie on like pop songs where it's like, yeah, the, they try and put the emotion out there, but it just doesn't seem like it's really genuine. This is something completely on the other side where, yeah, it ta- it talks about something that seems real. But when you listen to the vocals, especially from you, especially with the different pacings, the different melodies and the different pitches. Holy shit, this is emotional. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you've you felt it before. So, I mean, you know what it's like. It's uh, And it's that's a- one of. Th- I was saying that's one of the great things I love. To go through, man. Yeah, and that's one of the great things I love listening to, like rock and metal as well, because there's so many different songs I listen to where I'm picking up on certain, like especially I look at the lyrics as well, try and get a, like a feel for what the meaning of the song is, and then especially I look at the meaning after I listen to it as well, I try and figure out, okay, do they match that feel? Do they match that meaning? And on this one, it was like you got to be kidding me. You guys matched it perfectly. I've heard other songs like uh, the band Polaris, their song Above My Head, where it talks all about depression being in your own head and you can't get out. And I'm like, yeah, they match that one perfectly because I went through the exact same thing and it hit. This one did the exact same thing. Heck yeah, man. <laughs> and so if anyone's ever had trouble where it comes to vocalize, like kind of like vocalizing uh, like certain feelings or thoughts to a significant other, certain thoughts or feelings to someone of the opposite sex or same sex or whatever you're attracted to. Yeah, this one is something that you can really get behind. And again, I think that bluesy more, again, that Prince feel to it just really sticks out with a, like a Prince hard rock, Southern rock kind of vibe. I don't know how you guys mixed it that way, but <laughs> holy shit, is it good? I guess we got lucky on that one, man. I'm not sure if you, I, well, especially if you're thinking about the rest of the album, I don't think you guys got lucky. I think you guys are just really damn good at writing this stuff. Thank you, brother. I'll say I got, I got one more I kind of want to go through and taking a look at it. It's the one that's your top on Spotify due to the fact that, again, it's probably the most, it's the most popular coming off of this album with Can't Sleep. And kind of feel like I think a lot of fans would probably enjoy a little conversation about Can't Sleep. So let's dive deep into this one. What was this one really about? What was the inspiration behind this one? Um, I think the inspiration behind that one uh, kind of came from that feeling of... Uh, I was in a relationship at the time, or not at the time, uh, at one point where um, I knew it wasn't working out. I knew that this other person wasn't my future, but I just didn't know how to bring that up to them, kind of. Uh, so you're just kind of holding on to that, that secret, I guess, from that other person until it kind of eats you up. And uh, that's, that's kind of where this came from. Um, you know, they're and, and you know that they're thinking, you know, what what is the deal? What's going on? Because when you're with somebody for a long period of time, they can kind of read you. And uh, so this is it's kind of about that. Again, no wonder why I felt this song to another dimension as well, because, again, felt the same thing. And then when you're talking about you're adding the title Can't Sleep. I mean, just especially for me on my end, as well as when that kind of relationship deteriorated and then other things in life were happening as well, that I'll, I'll put it this way, that did not work out very well for me and just bad things were happening. My life was kind of crumbling around me. And one of the major problems that I had from the outset of that was I couldn't sleep. So a song like that's called can't sleep that talks about this. I'm just thinking, are, are you guys just trying? Did you guys like have a camera into my life for three years ago? Cause <laughs> we did, we did. It's up in the corner. Behind that it's poster. up in the corner. Uh, yeah. You guys still have it up there. I, I just moved in May. <laughs> yeah. We followed you, man. Man, you guys work fast. Holy shit. 
Very diligent. <laughs> Whoever is moving that camera deserves a raise because I had no <laughs> if, through through not only through two different moves and then it's that was hidden. That well, yeah. Jesus, you that, that guy deserves a raise. I gotta say that. Yeah, he 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 should be working for the CIA for sure. And 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 if it's you, then I'm just gonna be even more weird about the fact that I'm talking to the guy that's moving the camera around in my house. It was it was me. It was me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm gonna, keep my, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep my eyes on you now. Twilight Zone. No. Oh, oh, I've, been, I've watched too much Twilight Zone, so I kind of get the feeling it's like. Doo, 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 doo. I'm expecting Rod Sterling just to come out all of a sudden, just say, "Imagine a world where." Oh God, Rod, no. There you go. It's happening. Oh, oh dear God, now I'm now I'm getting scared. I, okay, I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. God damn, it, I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. Perfect song title, man. Perfect song title. There you go. I don't know how you did it, but jumping into this one, the thing that really got me curious about it was you start with this like electronic soundscape and then it kind of entered into more of like a slower intro guitar with a little bit of twang to it. Then all of a sudden the bass follows suit, the drum follows suit to create more of this melodic and depressed intro that again had this like post grunge Southern rock mix. It came to a head again. And for me personally, when I hear a lot of electronic soundscapes in the intro, I'm like, Okay, I'm a little curious about that. That's never really my forte, really what I care for that much. But then again, I always have to think, okay, how's this gonna how's this gonna work out? It's a whole song. How's this gonna end up intro or transitioning through the intro? And for myself and how I really like music, this was something I really did enjoy and how that kind of brought more of this again, like that post grunge Southern rock mix to forward and just how the instrumentals kind of from the guitar, the bass, and drums kind of amped up into it at the same time. Yeah, I think uh on this one in particular uh we did a little little something different um than we normally do it's not it's not so much uh riff driven as some of the other stuff that we do and uh it's kind of like uh an example that might come to mind would be like uh kings of leon you know where uh it starts it starts with the bass doing this one thing and then the guitar's doing this one thing and then you know you kind of just stack each element until there's this sound you know to where you uh you just got this wall of, of sound, but it's all from these different pieces, you know, this, and they kind of just keep repeating until you got what you're looking for, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like a slow build as well, where you're getting those different pieces and you're starting to add them together and you're slowly kind of building up the song to a head where you're going to get to the chorus where it's going to end up just being full force into you where everything's going to come to a head. But again, you're slowly building up on that. And I did like that on this song because when you listen to the verses, they're very similar to what the intro was bringing into with, the, again, more of like a more melodic, more depressed, post-grunge, southern rock feel to it, which I was like, OK, this is definitely something that is interesting. However, it did stick out incredibly well because I, it was all depend upon where the chorus was going to go, how this was going to sound. When I heard the chorus... All I could think was this is where this song absolutely shines in the end because I love how this that verse and how that sound just transitions in the chorus with some of the drum fills you work with and then going to something that's slower, melodic, hard rock. And I, I got to bring up the band again because it's just the way the construction is and the way everything flows. And I love how this band writes those flows. And I feel like you guys have the same kind of workmanship in that. I'm going to bring up Alter Bridge again, man. I can't help it. <laughs> not that I'm, I'm not mad at you, man. I love Alter Bridge, so... And then again, diving a little bit deeper into it, the tone of the guitar is what really made all the difference on this as it's able to keep that Southern rock feel, but also heighten the emotion of the song and make it more personal after something that's a little bit more, I would say blank in the verses where it's a little bit more drawn back, a little bit more of like a depressed sound, a little bit more melodic sound there. And I absolutely love the move on this one because it creates such a fantastic contrast in there through different parts of the song. And again, like you're talking about that Kings of Leon sound where you're doing that slow build to get to the chorus and it just is all their full force. Yeah, this absolutely hit on that. Sure. And then as I've done with every other song, let's go to you on the vocals. And in this one, I thought your vocals did exactly what they needed to do in order to make the song really shine. Because when you look at the verses, those vocals, they sound a little bit more downtrodden, but it's really needed to kind of make you feel like a certain empty feel that those that for the songs meaning where you can't really where you're like, you, you just can't you're just afraid to kind of vocalize what you're thinking or feeling towards a person that you care about or like a significant other. So it's it kind of like that empty one's like they're trying to kind of ask you like something's wrong. I know something's wrong. Please tell me what's wrong. And it's kind of like, uh, uh, it's just kind of that empty feeling of like, I got to get yeah. out there, but I can't. 
then you get this more impactful and full emotional tone in the chorus and it matches the guitar tone perfectly and it amplifies the message of the song where it needs to be just from the difference of the verses and the chorus this again was well done and i can easily say this is the most popular song in your album because you have that southern rock mix with the post grunge emotion it works well to build the song in order to show both more like a depressing more desperate emotion sound to it your vocals i love what the vocals did on this one specifically because you listen to what the instrumentation needed on this one. You listen to what they needed to amplify that sound and amplify the emotion, amplify the feeling. And you just basically let the vocals and the vocal patterns write themselves. And it worked out to a T. It was a hit every step of the way. Thank you, brother. So we've gone through four. And one thing I always like to do, and especially when I go through an album is I always do like a full on like, okay, let's wrap it all together in a nice little bow for everybody for my thoughts as well. And I hope you're going to be happy with this one. So my final thought on Under the Sun was overall, I can tell you that Blacktop Mojo definitely has something going on in terms of their songwriting ability. And I have that I've not seen in quite a while. They take their hard rock and post grunge influences and blend together to create songs that really have a harder meaning and feel them based on the post grunge influence. However, they also have a unique feel overall, giving the inclusion of the Southern rock melodies that make this sound stand out. Matt's vocals remind me at times of Miles Kennedy and Chris Cornell, which make this album stand out as well when it comes to blending their influences in and using his emotion to match the story that the instrumentals need to tell as well. Sometimes they do things that I think could have been done just slightly a little bit better. But again, when I think those, that's just me being really, really nitpicky. And back when I asked all the Sirius XM Octane fans who they were listening to, no wonder why Black Top Mojo was consistently set as one of the top uh, suggestions. Their sound is great, and I can see why they are really climbing in the minds of rock and metal fans. So, yeah, you can see why I was excited to have you on the podcast today. <laughs> I'm glad to be here, brother. Thanks for having me on. So, you, you heard my whole thoughts on a couple of songs. You heard my full thoughts on the Under the Sun album. So, when you guys released it, what was the initial reception from the fans, and what was basically the... Also, the reception from the rock community as well on this album. Um, I felt like it was overall pretty good. Um, we got playlisted on a couple of Spotify playlists. Um, we're very fortunate to do that. Um, we got to push "Can't Sleep" out to the radio and uh, did pretty well there. And uh, got to uh, got to tour off of this. Uh, fortunately, we put this out I think in September of last year. So uh, we did get a little bit of touring to where we got to play these new songs for for people you know, and, and travel around the country. And that's always the best part is uh, seeing the reactions of, you know, in person of the crowd, you know, um, from, from the new songs. Cause you don't ever really know how it's going to go until you're there in the room with them. And uh, so that was always, that was always fun to see. And uh, hopefully we get the opportunity to do that again when all this uh, craziness is over. I mean, especially hope they get the opportunity, like, let's say beginning of 2021, because as we're getting closer yeah. towards that time, it's like, OK, what are things going on? I know there are some bands that are still playing concerts right now, but it's a lot smaller shows. So it's just like it all depends upon kind of basically what 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 everyone wants to do right now. If if you don't feel comfortable enough to go out and play shows, I don't I don't want you to because I want you guys to feel comfortable with what you want to do. It all depends upon what you don't want to do as a band. But initially when it came out when you're at those shows, I mean I can easily see why a lot of those people would just really get into this album because you're talking about a lot of things that people have gone through in their lives that people have experienced as well that they can really not I would say match up with you completely but relate so that all of a sudden it's like, okay, you're telling your story. And it's like, oh man, I can kind of feel the same way because even though my story is different, it's similar in the same concept. And the emotion of those songs and the feeling of them is perfectly matching what I felt. So it's giving a tangible, basically a tangible meaning to this, to what I felt. So when you see those fans out there and they're really getting into the song and, you know, they're, they're constantly just like going banging their heads like this, just, yeah, just rocking out to it. I mean, you're really seeing these people, especially like for some like myself, feel the music and just really get in deep with it and letting all their inhibitions go to the wind because they're experiencing something whole they're experiencing something genuine they're experiencing something that they're never going to get anywhere else for sure man uh it's nice uh it's nice to know you're not alone you know it's it's the same feeling for me you know telling these stories to everybody and uh seeing that i'm not alone you know what i mean (laughs) yeah and and i'm have you had people come up and talk to you about like especially if they've been like getting really into the songs they've really connected emotionally like sharing their stories with you and just really connect with the band in a whole nother way 
Oh, absolutely, man. Uh, it's always, it's really cool. Um, like you said, their stories might not be the exact same as, as what I went through or what we went through, but, uh, it's really cool to see how that song has made its way into their lives and how they have interpreted it and how it, uh, and what it means to them. Have you, um, when it came to touring, especially right when this album came out and just at the end of 2019, maybe a little bit early in 2020 before, damn you COVID because I, because not only, I mean, not only did everyone lose shows that they were going to play, like you guys, a lot of other bands that I've talked to and a lot of other bands that I haven't talked to, but like for a, from a fan perspective, I'm like, I've had so many shows I was supposed to go to. I would have ended up seeing you guys at rock fest because especially with that group that I would have been going with, there would have been no way there would have been like, okay, even if I would have been doing something else like if i had another band song they're like they didn't drag me out they're like you gotta go see black top mo johnny i'm like oh what what okay i'm just gonna go with this because they're always right and then i would have seen you guys been like yeah chris you were totally right on this <laughs> absolutely well hopefully uh fingers crossed for rock fest next year man because i know they're i think they're trying to reschedule a lot of the same bands from what i've seen so i mean i'm not, I'm not gonna ask you if you've you heard anything in it, but what I'm gonna say is hopefully you guys come back because I know that's the plan for us next year. Oh yeah, fingers crossed, brother. And then if and then if not, um hopefully you guys get able to play around, especially around the area, or either like the Wisconsin area, so especially with me being in Milwaukee, or if you're up in like Minneapolis or something, because that's where my buddy that loves you guys lives, or in Chicago because it's ninety minutes my ninety no, yeah, ninety minutes away from me. And I've gone to see shows there plenty, and I really like going to some of those venues, so I'm like if I see, okay, Blacktop Mojo, okay, they're going to be around in Chicago only. All righty, let's make sure we mark that day on the calendar. All righty, let's make sure we have a way down there. If I have to stay down there, if I have to get to a quick rest stop and pass out my car, whatever it takes, we're making this happen. Absolutely, man. I like your attitude. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Wisconsin's always been really kind to us, man. We always we always end up crisscrossing through there at least once or twice every t- every time we go out. So. How much beer do you guys usually drink when you come here? Because, you know, we here in Wisconsin, we love our beer. Um, quite a bit, man. I, I love, I love uh, partaking in the old spotted cow whenever I'm in Wisconsin. So, um, do you guys just like when you come here, just like buy like three or four cases of it, load up the van. It's like, okay, we're taking this back with us. Let's go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I don't blame you. Throw them in the bay of the bus. <laughs> I'll say definitely if I do the whole if when I plan on doing that whole entire Winnebago idea where it's going to be going around to a couple of rock festivals, especially rock fest, pack up a bunch of coolers full of water, Gatorade, beer, whatever everyone needs, have bands come over, hang out, do a little podcast for like 15 minutes, have a drink with them, whatever they need. I'll definitely have Spotted Cow and whatever else you guys like too, because all of a sudden I'll be like, hey, guess what, Blacktime Mojo, come on, we'll just hang out for like 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, what do you got? That's like, what kind of beer do you got? What kind of beer don't I have is the real question. I'll have like three. I might have three or four coolers with it, especially with the group I'd be going with too. Because that's the way to do it. That is the way to do it. Plus, it's it's nice. I always like drinking beer with people. I mean, even when I go over to parties by friends' houses, I'm, it's pretty much expected that I'm going to bring it at the bare minimum a twelve pack. Yeah, I mean, sharing is caring. You know, it it re- it really is because it's just. That's how you because all of a sudden it's like, what happens if no one brings anything? It's like then everyone's kind of a little bit antsy. Everyone's like, oh, man, we wish we had something. All of a sudden I show up with a 12 pack or there was one group that I was with. We were going to do like a friends giving the day after Thanksgiving. And right as I was leaving my house, I'm like, I called my friend. I'm like, hey, do you guys have anything to drink over there? I'm right about to pass a liquor store and I'm just curious. And he's like, yeah, we have like a bottle of rum and that's it. I'm like. Okay, thanks for telling me. So here I walk in with a whole case of Spotted Cow and like a whole case of Corona with two limes, mind you. I drop it on the bar. I'm like, you guys can thank me later. And I just, I took I took a Spotted Cow and I walked outside because my friend was grilling. I just sat out there with him. He's like, what the hell did you just do? I'm just like, oh, I just dropped all the beer off in there. They can put it in the fridge what they want, but it's still cold. He brought the party. That's what he did. Yeah. The, I mean, unfortunately, Kesha didn't say right that the party don't start till I walk in. There you go. Because I'm the one bringing all the beer. Just, ah. and I've talked to other bands as well. It's just like, if I go and see them, I think it's kind of also expect them to bring at least some kind of beer with me. I told, there's one from Australia where she's like, yeah, I really like, she's like, talk, we were talking about different alcohol and beer. And she's like, yeah, I really like, like try some of the stuff. I'm like, okay. In my mind, I'm thinking that means I definitely have to bring like some something. I have to bring some spotted cow. I have to bring something crazy. And all of a yeah. sudden, I'm going to end up, like, knocking on their tour bus, like, at the rave here in Milwaukee. 
And just all of a sudden, they're going to wonder how the heck I got back there. I'm just going to have a case of beer. I'm like, this is how I got back here. Yeah, there you go, man. So if I see you guys are going to play at like the Raver somewhere here in Milwaukee, if you guys get to knock on your tour bus and there's a guy holding Spotted Cow, it just, it's probably going to be me. There you go, man. Bring that, bring that Wisconsin flavor. Okay, for you guys, it might be like two or three cases then. <laughs> <laughs> So one other thing I want to ask about is, especially with how wacky of a time we're in, with how weird of a scenario we're in with COVID-19, since this all happened, what have you guys been doing to not only grow the influence of the band, but also like grow as musicians at the same time as well? Um, we've been doing a lot of live streaming stuff. Uh, Kat and I, like I said, we used to play in bars and stuff for four or five hours at a time, sometimes just playing covers and requests. And um, so we thought it would be fun. Uh, we did it for a little while. Every Thursday we would do a request show basically where people, people could request songs and we'd learn them for the next week and uh, just kept that going for a little while. And we'll probably pick that back up again. And then uh, we've been doing a lot of different live streaming stuff. Uh, we played a show with uh, clutch not too long ago. Nice. Uh, live stream. Uh, we're going to be doing another one. Uh, with a few other bands coming up in September. Um, we're actually doing one tomorrow night for uh, uh, the number one tequila company. Uh, oh, really? Should be fun. Uh, it'll be on all their socials. So uh, tomorrow night at uh, 10 Eastern, I believe. So nine o'clock Wisconsin time. All righty. I got another podcast I have to uh, record tomorrow, but it might be, it should be done by that time, nine o'clock central time yeah, here man. in Wisconsin. So I might have to, number one tequila company, up, dial it up and all of a sudden, bing, bang, boom. All of a sudden, watch you guys fun be sitting there just like, oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> oh yeah. But uh, I do like, I do like the live stream idea as well as there's, I've seen a lot of bands do that as, as well as just to try and garner, like keep up with the fans, kind of keep new things coming out and just keep connecting with them. But the fact that you guys have been doing it consistently and especially doing the request kind of style as well, where you're not just constantly playing the same stuff over again, over and over again. It's you're actively taking part in your fan community as well, where it's okay. What do you guys want to listen? What do you guys want to hear us try and play? And you're showing them that, okay, we are at, we are listening to you. We are taking your requests and then we are doing the best we can to perform these songs for you cover style, but also give a little, you know, black top mojo flair in there at the same time as well. For sure. For sure, man. Um, yeah, we're, we're very fortunate. We have a, a, a great group of uh, fans that have really kept us going through all this and uh, tune into everything we do. And uh, it makes us not miss the road so much. You know, we miss it, but uh, at least we at least we can at least we have the Internet. You know yeah. what I mean? at, at least there's something because you imagine if this would if you guys had been a band like, let's say, like 20 years ago and something like this would have happened. And then you the Internet wouldn't have been nearly as prominent as it would have been. Right. I don't know. I don't know what what anybody would have done, man. That, that's it's crazy to think about. Thankfully, we don't. Thankfully, we can. We just have to think about it. We don't have to actually live it due to the fact that it's, again, you're taking a look at what's happened in the world. And right now, it's just with everything that's going on, you can't change what's happened. So you got to figure out, okay, what's the situation? What's the scenario that we're playing in now? And how can we make it the best possible for us? Because I've seen a good amount of bands where all of a sudden it's like they've been trying new things. I mean, I'll use a couple of examples, like the band from Ashes and who doing their kind of covers as well. And then some of the wacky stuff they've done. It's really worked out for them. I can see it's worked out for you guys as well, especially with keeping up with the fans. Um, other people have tried other different things like, uh, let's see, another good one. Like uh, Ronnie Radke of Falling Reverse doing the whole entire Twitch stream, becoming like the top Twitch streamer, like in the top 10. So it's like there's, yeah. so, many diff- there's so many different things that a lot of people are trying. But the key is you got to be doing something. You can't just you like be. do nothing. Otherwise... People are going to forget about you eventually. As long as you're doing something, you're still connecting with the fans and you're still showing that you guys are out there. You guys are doing something that's going to end up not only growing your fan base, but it's also going to bring you closer to that fan base as well. And I think those request shows are a great way to go about it again, because you're just you're absolutely showing that when the fans are sending you something, you're listening and you're taking it to heart and you are really diving deep into it. Absolutely, man. It's uh. It's fun to keep up with all your friends from around uh, around the world and, and be able to, you know, talk to them, even though you might not be seeing them on the road and all that. So, so around the world, that's uh, 
Have you have you guys ever played in outside the U.S. like over in Europe or something? Because I haven't really checked. I haven't. I I, I dove deep in that, but I didn't dive that deep. <laughs> we haven't. Uh, we haven't gotten to play in in Europe yet, but uh, hopefully, fingers crossed for twenty twenty one. Yeah. Well, I got a feeling for 2021, there's going to be a lot of bands out there that are going to be like a lot of those like real heavy hitters, the ones that are making like doing those gigantic tours. I'm thinking about because I just saw one for, uh, today. Yeah, was it was today or yesterday. I can't remember what day it was, but it was uh, Parkway Drive reannounced their tour for 2021. And it was like they had like 10 or like 12 or 13 dates in the US. But just taking a look at some of the bands in the bill, it's just like these are absolutely gigantic shows and the bands that are yeah. on the bill. It's like this is going to be incredible for some for something like that and then there's going to be a lot of other bands where it's like okay here we are it's i'm talking about the big heavy hitters okay here we are we are going to go on these tours and it's going to be huge we need to find bands to also open up for us so we can create this incredible show for our fans and then also that's going to help bands like blacktop mojo get in with those bands and also play live shows over in different parts of the world and i can easily see that happening with you guys as well because of the unique sound that you have and Honestly, I'm gonna put it out there already. Um, so guys from Alter Bridge, if you guys are gonna go play in Europe next year, um, pick a Blacktop Mojo as your opener. Tr- trust me on this one, guys. Trust me, it will work out perfectly for you. Put it out in the universe, man. Put out, put out in the universe. I mean, it would be kind of crazy as all of a sudden you guys are opening, and then in the middle between you and Alter Bridge is you bring Mark Tremonti back out there, and you let Tremonti just rip it up for 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah, one day, one day. I mean that would be that would be an incredible show. And actually, don't just do that in Europe. Can you bring that here as well? Because that would be something I would totally be down to go and just see and just literally just sit there and just. This is freaking awesome. Yeah. Plus, I actually have a feeling a lot of people would just be like, "Holy crap!" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really, I really hope that this is the case, though. So, um, I'm gonna see if I can try and like if I can send this to. Uh, Mark Tremonti or Miles Kennedy or something like that. I'm not sure how well I how 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 well it would get through, but um, all you can fun. do is try, brother. All, all I can all I can do is try, and that's one thing I've been doing where it's like trying to get some bands where it's like okay, I I love the bands I've talked to, but let's try and start get some a little bit more of the heavy like a little bit heavier hitters than what I have been getting, and I'm like yeah. okay, let's try and focus because I kind of I love talking to as many people as possible. I love talking to bands that I've been getting into, and all of a sudden I'm like oh, seeing people say, dude, we love Blacktop Mojo. I'm like. Let's go for it. And then, yay. Uh, here we are. Yeah. And here we are. And right now, Matt, we've done about an hour and 20. And we've gone through a lot of this. I mean, we did a deep dive into Under the Sun. We've talked about a lot that's gone on that album and how just how crazy the construction is on that album and how incredible the songwriters you guys are to create this whole entire album that has these different influences that really work so well together and that your vocal power that matches it incredibly well. So I'm very incredibly pleased. I'm like, holy crap. I should have asked you guys about this earlier. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. And also love the fact that you guys are still all living together because in the in the end, that's going to end up making the band inc- like not only not only has it made that ba- your band strong, but it's going to continue to make it stronger than a lot of the other bands out there due to the fact that not only you're always together, but you're always creating together. You're always, you're always there for everybody so that the chemistry just keeps building and building and building. So if you get something like, uh, shoot, I have it in my head. I drawn up like right now, like the lashing where it just sounds like, okay, this doesn't sound like it's like fully black top mojo. It's like black top mojo mixed with wait, Prince, does this work? And I'm sitting here thinking, dude, this freaking works. Are you kidding me? Thank like, you, really. it's absolutely oh. incredible and i i love it and i went from being like okay you know i've heard i've heard some black top mojo stuff i'm i like the band but i'm not too deep into it but then after i went after this album i'm like yeah this this is this is my level of liking the band it's like from here i mean this is relative right now you don't know how low the bottom is it's, i mean the floor is like three feet down it went from here to all of a sudden it's like okay i'm off screen now let's just keep going Yep. Uh, uh, it won't stop. Uh, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you deep in, uh, diving deep into it, brother. That, that means a lot. 
it's, it's something that I love to do because it's just somewhere I, I love to see how different how different artists create different songs and how they blend different things together and how they use their influences to create their own sound. And your sound, again, like I said at the beginning, it's something that I haven't heard a long time, especially with that Southern rock feel to it. But you do it so well that it just matches perfectly together. This was this was an incredible outing from you guys. I think that is the one of the best ways to put it. This album is just absolutely incredible. Love it. Thank you, bro. And on that note, because again, I think we're approaching our app. I, we pretty much went through a whole bunch of stuff and absolute love Blacktop Mojo for this and love you guys for this. So um, I think we've kind of come to a perfect ending point for this. So Matt, I'm going to give you a chance to say some final words and just say whatever you feel like. Just go for it. <laughs> um, Check us out on our live stream for uh, number one tequila tomorrow night, I guess. I don't know when this is coming out. Um, <laughs> we'll have another live stream on uh, September 17th with a lot of uh, a lot of other talented bands. And uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, check out our music on wherever you listen to music at, man. All righty. Well, I like to end with this because this is something that is a little bit more my style and kind of fits with what I actually went to school for. So I went to school, guys, for um, for for econ. I was an econ major, so I understand th- certain things about consumer behavior, certain things about um, opportunity costs and convenience and all that kind of stuff. So when it comes to any Blacktop Mojo, do you guys know Blacktop Mojo? Most most likely, I would assume so because this band is incredible. But if you haven't and you're like, OK, where should I go and find them? Um, how do I follow them? How do I listen to their music? Oh, I wish there was just one place to click on all this stuff where I could just find something. I'll click a link and then boom, I'm there. I'm at their Facebook page, Instagram page, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever it might be. Let me tell you something. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Google Play or if you're watching the YouTube video, just look at the description. I'm finding everything I can and all the links are going to be there. So you have a one-stop shop where you can follow them on their socials, where you can find their live streams and where you can find everything you need to know about Blacktop Mojo to get into them, to listen to their music. I mean, let me put it this way. I'm giving you guys no excuse. It's one (laughs) click and you guys are going to get the Blacktop Mojo. I mean, if you listen to this podcast and you don't know who Blacktop Mojo is, you're going to love them by the the time you get to this point. So yeah, just go follow them, please, please. Please. Give it a click. Give it a click. <laughs> just, just give it a click and give it a listen and then just keep streaming their music, man, because damn, is it good. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate you having me on here, man. <laughs> well, Matt, I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. I hope you had a blast because I always say this, that I have a blast doing these and I always get so amped up doing these. This was one I was a, honestly, I was a little bit anxious to do because I'm like, holy shit, I can talk to Black Tom Mojo. No freaking way. And before this, my heart was kind of like, okay, okay, okay. This is getting a little bit antsy. All of a sudden, yeah. I'm just thinking, man, this is a fun-ass episode. And I love doing these. But the fact of the matter is, is I always say that because it is the truth. I love doing these. And this was this was something that I is incredible. This was – this I, when, I, when I saw that I was going to be able to interview you today, like this made my whole entire month after the good month I've had. Like this was like one of the highlights. This one might have been the highlight of the month. I'm glad to hear it, brother. We'll be back anytime, man. Just- well, Matt, I'm going to end with this. Thank you for being on the Core Progression Podcast. Everyone, please go listen to Blacktop Mojo. Stream all their stuff. Follow all their stuff. Can't wait to not only have these guys back in the podcast again, have Matt back on the podcast again, but also see them live and share a beer with them. Cause I'm, but trust me, when it comes to sharing a beer, I'm buying. Amen. <laughs> you got it, brother. All right. Thanks, man. And I'm not going to end with a goodbye because this definitely isn't goodbye. This is definitely a see you later. Till next time. Whoa, 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 folks. That was my interview with Matt from the band Blacktop Mojo, bringing their hard rock, post grunge, southern rock, metal flair to the world. And they're one of the most unique bands I think I've had in the podcast. Through the fact that I haven't heard that southern rock vibe in a long time. And God, they mix it so well. So I really hope you guys like this episode where we did a deep dive into a couple songs from Under the Sun. We really went in deep on all that stuff. You get to hear some so- stories from the band about how they came forward, about them living in a house together, which I did not know they still did and just all the fun stuff they've been doing since the pandemic happened i mean we really went deep into it and i feel like if you really like black top mojo's music that you you love this podcast due to the fact that we went so deep on some of these things that it was incredible so 
as we close it, please get in with Black Tom Mojo if you haven't already. Look at the links in the description of this podcast, whether it's a video or the audio stream, because they're all going to be there for Black Tom Mojo. And please follow us on My Song Day Rock 2008 Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We've got a lot more stuff for you guys on those platforms as well, including the podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and on YouTube as well. On the YouTube channel, we do videos every single Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Central of a bunch of crazy stuff, whether it's, you know, top 10 lists, some special things about the emerging bands in the scene today day album reviews we do it all so please go and follow us there and links are going to be in the description and guys that's going to be it for me today this one was incredible so thank you for watching and listening to the Core Progression Podcast, where we're interviewing all the emerging bands in the scene. They're going to be the biggest bands in the 2020s and 2030s. So get on them now because then you have bragging rights over your friends. That's going to be it for me today, guys. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I end every single one of these episodes with a big, healthy, and hearty. See you!